Welcome to the Word of Life Center podcast. It's our desire that today's message would equip and empower you to see the Word of God bring life to your life. Want to, t- today is a little bit of a different Sunday, and you're probably like, well, I've already figured that out. <laughs> see all the stuff on the, on the platform. And um, what... Excuse me, real quick. Let me get this fixed right now before we get going. Um, I mean, everybody say, thank God for technology. Yeah. It's great as long as it works. When it doesn't work, I just want to throw it across the... But anyway, um, uh, today's a little bit different than Sunday. And I think it's good that periodically as a church, we, 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 we stop and we pause for a moment and we make sure that we are keeping the main thing the main thing. And you say, well, what is the main thing? The main thing is our vision. The main thing is why we do what we do. How many realize it's important that we understand and we know why we do what we do as a church? Can somebody say amen to that? And here's the reason. Great things can happen. Great things do happen when there's clarity. Great things can happen when there's clarity of vision, when there's clarity of purpose. I'm going to say it one more time. Great things can happen when there's vision and when there's clarity of purpose. I can use this example. Uh, How many of you know that we're celebrating, uh, as of yesterday, yesterday we celebrated a great milestone in the United States of American history. Anybody know what it was? Apollo 11. Apollo 11. Apollo 11 was uh, uh, the uh, mission that the United States, actually was a part of a series of missions, and the goal was to put a man on the moon. And, and how many of you know we did that? The United States of America was the first country, first nation, which was a great step, it's a great accomplishment, to put a man on the moon and then get him back home. How many knows it's one thing to get there, but it's another thing to bring him back home, right? <laughs> And so uh, Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, 50 years ago, July 20th, 1969, it was the first human on the moon, and it was a great day for our nation. And, but I want to say this. I want to make the connection here. But great churches can be like great nations. Great nations can be like great churches. How many of you believe that we have a great church here at Word of Life Center in Shreveport, Louisiana? You believe that? Amen. I do. I do. So thankful. So, so thankful. So, so thankful. But how many of you know we can get better and we want to get better? We're not going to stay the same. We're not going to stay where we are today. We're never satisfied with it. We're thankful for where we are today, but we have to move forward. We have to move forward. We just can't sit back and go, oh, what? It's, it, uh, you know, it's been great. It's been amazing. We've got to move forward in being the great church that God's uh, called us to do. So this morning, I want to share three must. These are three things that we have to have to do great things for God and with God. Three things we have to have to do great things and to, to accomplish what it is that God has called us to accomplish. If you're taking notes this morning, go ahead and write the first one down. If you're not taking notes, you're not planning on taking notes, go ahead and take this down. <laughs> I like what someone said. I heard it uh, not long ago. It was a great statement. Uh, note takers are history makers. Yeah. Note takers are history makers. And so some people are already like, well, let me get my notebook out. I want to be, be a history maker. So the number one, we want to be a great church, just like a nation is great and does great things, is you have to know what, write this down, mission. You have to know what your mission is. You have to know what your mission is because the mission, the mission is the what. The mission is the what. This is what we are here to do. And there has to be clarity to that mission. That's the reason we're taking time like this Sunday and we're talking about it. Because there has to be clarity because sometimes uh, you can get busy and things are moving and things are happening and you, use, you lose that clarity. Here's what Habakkuk chapter 2 says about clarity and mission. Habakkuk chapter 2, if you've been around church a little bit, you've probably heard this, uh, this uh, verse of scripture. It says, then the Lord answered me, talking to Habakkuk the prophet, write the vision Write the vision, get it down, watch this, make it clear on tablets so that anyone can read it quickly. And so here Habakkuk is saying, or God is speaking to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you need to do something very important. Get the vision, number one, make it clear. Get the vision and make it clear. Get the vision and make it clear. Why? You want to do that, Habakkuk, so that when people see it, they can move forward. 
So when they see it, they can move forward. So when they realize it, that they can move forward so that they don't have to stay in the place that they're in. That's what God spoke to Habakkuk. Bring that clarity. As a matter of fact, it was in uh, July of 1969, of course, when uh, uh, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the, the moon for the first time. But that's not the first time it was spoken of. That's not the first time anybody thought about it. Because the truth is, in, in September of 1962, President John Kennedy stood and he made a speech. He made a speech. Let me put it this way. He made the vision clear. And here's what he said. He said, in the next decade, talking to this nation, in the next decade, we will, the United States of America, will put a man on the moon. It's going to happen. Take it to the bank. And I love what he said. He said this. He said, as a nation, we're not doing this because it's easy. He said, as a nation, we're doing it because it's hard. How many of you, some, how many realize some things don't come easy? Some things don't come easy. There are some things uh, that you need to fight for. Some things you have to pursue. Some things you have to have discipline for. Some things you have to determine that you're not going to quit. What are those some things? Those some things are great things, ladies and gentlemen. Great things don't come easy, but, but by the grace of God in context of the church or our church, we're going to move forward. We're going to keep moving forward because we have clarity in regards to our mission and, and, and we're going to move forward in a way that, that makes the devil mad, but, but that populates heaven. Can somebody say amen to that? We don't care if the devil gets mad. We don't care if he tries to make it hard. We win. Can somebody say amen to that? Well, somebody's excited about that. Several months ago, Pastor Sam gathered us as a staff. We gathered in the, in the fellowship hall. We, it was the upper room. We gathered there in the, in the upper room, and, and he did just exactly what we're talking about. He made the vision very clear. He made the vision for our church and our future very, very clear. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what is it? I want to know. How many in the house want to know? Well, you've probably heard some of it before, but I'm going to say it again, right? He said, this is what we're here to do as a church. We're here to help people know God. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help people know God. Everybody say, know God. Not just about God. We want them to experience God. We want them to know him where they can live with him and walk with him and he can be in their life and, and they're in his life. We want people to know God. I mean, that's a great part of a mission. But it, it, we didn't stop with that. He said, we want, we want to help people know their purpose. You know, it's one thing to know God and people need to know God, but then they need to understand and discover what their purpose is. But then the third thing he said in making our vision clear, making our mission clear, is that we're here to help people make a difference. In other words, give them an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. Aren't you thankful that our pastor's not just sitting back and, and saying, hey, well, you know what? We're just going to coast on in. No, no, no. He's not doing that. He's standing up and he's told us and he's instructed us and he said this, we have a mission. And listen to me, that, that mission, that mission is to help people make progress. Now listen, we realize that we can't make the progress for them, but we can create paths and we can create, create opportunities and let people know, hey, wherever you are in your life, there's another step. Wherever you are, there's another step. You see, because our mission is marked by movement. Our mission is marked by movement. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the Bible describes our life, our life, all of our lives as a race, right? It's a race. And so I've been in a few races, and this is what I know about races. If you're racing, you're moving. If you're not moving, you're not racing. <laughs> How many, of you, how many of you believe it's the will of God for us to move and that if we've been saved 40, uh, four days, 40 days, or 40 years, there's always another step for us? And, 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 and here is why this is so crucial. This is so important. Because we have four different types of people in this church. There are four different types of people in this room. Not just this room, but really any church on the planet, there are four different kinds of people. And Jesus describes them in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You remember the parable that he talked, talked about, the sower going out and sowing seed? And if you'll recall, and you can go back and read this in your, in your, in your uh, study this week, you can go back and read about the, that he talked about four different kind of people, and four, which really represented four different kind of hearts. So you probably put it together. We're going to talk about that just briefly. That's the reason we got these four chairs up here. 
And so the first type of person that's in this room right now, and it's really in any church, is Jesus described them in Mark chapter 4 as a person whose heart was hard. Everybody say hard. hard. Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> And they're, 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 they're sitting in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the seats, in the pews, all over America right now. And this person represents, a, 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 this person's, this chair represents a person whose heart has become resistant to God. In other words, it's just, it's just resistant to God. So the question is this, how does a person, how does a person's heart get that way? How does a person's heart become, become hard, resistant to God, resistant to the gospel, resistant to truth? Well, one of the ways, I think it's probably the main way, is that they have a, a, a bad experience with church. They, ha- they have a bad experience with church. And so a lot of times people, what, what happens is, is they say, you know what? I had a bad experience at church. Maybe they went to church and they weren't dressed like everybody else. And they felt like everybody was looking down on them because they weren't dressed the, the way that they should be dressed. Or they, 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 they had been doing things that they, 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 they didn't need to be doing, but yet people condemned them over or looked down on them because of it. How many, how many of you know we have no business doing that to people when they come into church? Can somebody say amen to that? But, but maybe, maybe this guy, maybe their, their heart is hard because they had a negative experience at church. So sometimes that's the reason. It's hard to get people, just invite them to come back in church because they've already had a negative one. Their heart's hard. It's resistant. But, but what needs to happen to this person? What, what, what needs to happen to this person? I, I can tell you what needs to happen to this person. This person needs, this person needs to know God. Because what they had experienced in the past was not God. It was religion, and it had nothing to do with God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So they need to know God. They need to know God. Everybody say, know God. God. Does that not sound familiar? (laughs) They need to take that step to know God, to know him. Well, what about the next person? Jesus talked about uh, this person in Mark chapter 4. He said, this is a person uh, he described their heart as being shallow. He described it as being just a little bit of soil with lots of stones and things in it. Just a shallow type of a soil, a shallow type of a heart. It's, it's, again, it's just this, this shallow kind of a person. But really, to dig into that and unpack it a little bit more, what it really does is it represents a person who just got saved. They're born again. <laughs> How many are thankful that we can be born again? How many of you remember the excitement when you got born again? It's like, hey, praise God. It's awesome. Couldn't be better. Life is great because I've been born. What? I've been born again. But here's what we know about that. We know the devil's coming. Right? Remember because Jesus said that Satan comes, what? Immediately to steal the word. So, So what needs to happen with this person? Well, this person, they need to discover not only that they're born again, that they know God, but they need to discover their purpose. That, that, that their purpose, their purpose is important to them. That their purpose is important to God. And here's why purpose is so important. That everybody gets this. You're, when you have purpose and you understand your purpose on the earth, you understand why God made you and why God created you. It's your purpose and understanding that that will carry you through difficult times. It will carry you through challenging times. Because you know, you know you've got a purpose. God's not going to leave you high and dry and he is with you and for you because you've got something to do on this earth. That's your reason God's gonna come through. Amen. Amen. So the the next, so this person, their heart is hardened, but listen, they got to discover why, why they're on the planet. I'm excited about this. Is anybody else excited about this? This This is vision, this is purpose. But, but, but what about, what about the, the third person that Jesus describes in Mark chapter 4? What about him? What, what does that look like? Well, it's this guy. It's the crowded. Their heart's crowded. What, is that, what does that mean? That means that, that they, they've been saved. They've been serving God. They've been walking with God. They're in church. But let me just say this. They're not all in. They're in, but they're not all in. They're in. But they're not all in and some are like, oh, no. (laughs) Listen to me. Listen to me. It describes a person who comes to church, that they come to services, they they, they, they come and they get their praise on and they get get blessed and they leave. 
And they leave because they're busy, because they've got so many other things going, and they don't really think much about God, and they don't really think much about His purpose. They don't really think much about His plan other than the time that they come to church. You say, what's the problem there? The problem is they are distracted. Their focus is on all these other places and all these other things. You say, well, well, what needs to happen with this person that has this crowded heart? What needs to happen with that person? Well, here's what needs to happen. They need to discover, they need to discover that they were created to make a difference. And listen to me, that life is not just about them. And they begin to realize that they need to simplify their life. They need to cut some things out of their life and focus on the main thing, which is making a difference. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Listen, there is nothing in life that will bring greater satisfaction to you than understanding and living a life where you are making a difference. Can somebody say amen to that? It's, it's, it's just, it simplifies life. It makes life a lot easier if, if you just get this. But then there's the fourth kind. There's the fourth heart that Jesus describes. It's the fourth one. And, 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 and I just call it the, the productive one. That's the one that's fruitful. You see around here, we call these, we call these, we call these people life givers. We call these people life givers. That they've, they've been here, they're in, but they're not just in, they're all in. Because they've been to discover and they've discovered why they're here. They discover where that they can make a difference and they begin to make a difference, yes, during the week, but they're also making a difference here on the weekend. They're creating opportunities for the hard-hearted people to know God. They're serving, and let me say this, servants make a difference. So they're serving and they're making a difference and you're probably like, oh, Pastor John, there you go again, you're trying to talk me into doing something. <laughs> But listen to me, I'm not trying to talk you into doing anything. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to present something so you can be something. And live the most satisfying life you can ever live. It's when you're productive and you're fruitful and you're a life giver. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen to me, and this is, not just about, this is not just about a few people doing this. This is about all of us. Listen, it took an entire nation to get three men to the moon. It took an entire nation to get three men to the moon. We're not talking about just going to the moon. We're talking about eternity, ladies and gentlemen. And it takes all of us, it takes all of us for, for, for people to get from there to here and help them make those steps and make those moves. So we have to have mission. Everybody say mission. mission. The next thing that we have to have, if we're going to be great, we're going to be better, we're going to take it to another level, is that we've got to have a method. We've got to have method. Everybody say method. method. And you're like, that sounds about as exciting as, <laughs> I don't know what. What do you mean method? Method just simply is the how. It means how we do this. It's how we do something. It's how we do what we do. It's how we help people know God and make a difference. You see, Jesus, when he came to the earth, he was focused. He knew he had a couple of things to do. One was to get to the cross to pay for our sins. Aren't you thankful for that? And, but, but, but yet he clarifies something in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says this. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come expecting to, uh, to be served by everyone. Isn't that amazing? He said, I'm not here so I can be served by everyone. What, what does he say? But to serve everyone. But to serve everyone and to give his life as a ransom price in exchange uh, for the salvation of many. So Jesus came and he's clarifying exactly what he came to do. He came to redeem, but he also came to serve and that's exactly what he did. He walked around, he moved all over the place. And, and the reason he did that is that he wanted to serve people. And there were people that got served. And, 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 and when, uh, what, we, what I mean by that is that there were people that Jesus came in contact with and he served them by giving what he had away. He, they, he gave them, he, he released what had been given to him in this mission that he was on. And you say, well, well Pastor John, give me, give me some examples of that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you asked me for that because th there was a gentleman, there was a gentleman that was a centurion. who wasn't even a Jew. 
He was a centurion, and, and he sent word to Jesus. He said, Jesus, listen, I've got a servant that's, that's very sick, but, but listen, here's the deal. You don't have to come here in order for him to be healed and to serve me. Uh, you can just say it. You can just say it. L -l listen, I want you to use your imagination just for a moment. Use your imagination just for a moment, and let's just imagine that he's on the platform. So we got him, right? We got the centurion, and he's here. And then there was another person. There was another person that, that Jesus served and he helped in this mission. It was, it was a woman with the issue of blood. And here's what she said. Here's what she said. Jesus didn't say anything to Jesus. She said to herself, listen, if I can just touch Jesus, we're talking about method, talking about method. If I can just touch Jesus, then, then, then not just Jesus, it's the hem of his garment, then I know my life's gonna be better. And then there was another person. There was another person. There was another person by the name of Jairus. Jairus. And here's what Jairus said. Jairus, Jairus came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I have a daughter that's sick. And if you'll just come to my house, talking about methods, if you'll just come to my house, I know that she'll live. How many of you know that she went to, uh, Jesus went to the house and, and he, she, he served in that moment. He served Jairus and his uh, family's life was changed. Can somebody say amen to that? So let's imagine we've got, we've got uh, the centurion. We've got the woman that had the issue of blood. And then we've got Jairus here. We're, we're going to interview them in just a moment because there's a fourth person. There's a fourth person that Jesus served and his name was Bartimaeus. Remember Bartimaeus? He was the blind guy. He was a blind guy, lots of crowded, it was a crowded day around Jesus. Jesus is walking through the crowd and Bartimaeus begins to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He did what? He cried out, or we could say it this way, he just screamed. So we got Bartimaeus up here, everybody with me? Everybody with me, got your imagination? So they're all up here and I, I'm interviewing them and I say this, I said, okay, um, tell me, Tell me, centurion, we don't know his name. Tell me, centurion, how did Jesus move in your life? How did, how, what was the method? How did Jesus move in your life? And he says, well, this is, how, this is how it works. This is how it happened to me, and this is how it works. He said, look, you, you don't have to do anything other than just say, tell Jesus, all you gotta do is just say. And as a matter of fact, he said, you know, he would say to us, I've got, I've got some sayers. <laughs> I got a whole group behind me. I got a whole group behind me because I've helped them understand how God works in their life. And they're all going like, yeah, if you want God to move in your life, that's how it's done. You gotta say. Remember, we're interviewing, right? So, so, so the centurion is telling his story and, and, then, and then the woman with the issue of blood uh, that had the issue of blood, she's over there shaking her head like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> that's not how it works. You don't just say, that's not how it works. It, 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 you got to touch Jesus. Everybody knows that's how, that's how it works. You got to touch him because when I touched him, my life was changed. She's got this big crowd behind her and they're like, yes, we're all the touchers because we believe that's how you get God to move. Talking about the method. And then you've got, you've got Jairus. You got Jairus and he's over there like, I can't wait till she gets done. I can't wait till she gets done because I'm going to tell them how to get Jesus to move in your life. This is the method. We all know that you got to get Jesus in the house. Can somebody say amen to that? But Jairus said, no, you, that's a, say yours. no, that's not how it works. Touch yours. No, no, no. It's you got to get Jesus in the house. As a matter of fact, I've got a whole bunch of, say, a bunch of in the house folks behind me. And they're like, yeah, that's how, that's how you get God to move in your life. Amen. And you got Bartimaeus. He's over here. He's rolling his eyes. And he just thinks, well, he can roll his eyes and can see at the same time. Amen. <laughs> so so he, he's over here. And he's over here. And he can't wait for the rest of them to shut up. Because he wants to tell them, he wants to tell everybody, he wants to tell everybody in this room how you really want to get God to move in your life. You got to scream. I mean, you got to scream. And you got the screamers behind going, yeah, that's how it works. You got to get God. If you want God to move in your life, it, the method is you got to scream and you just don't stop screaming. So can you imagine they're all talking at the same time and I, I just lost them. I mean, they're just arguing. And we're just sitting back watching like, man, this is getting fun in here. 
Then all of a sudden, Jesus walks in. And when Jesus walks in, they get quiet. They're quiet. And then he looks at the centurion. And he said, you know what? You were right. Then he looks at the woman that had the issue of blood. And he looks at her. And he goes, you know what? You were right. Then he looks at Jairus. And he says, you know the method? You were right. And then, and then he went to Bartimaeus. And he said, Bartimaeus, you know the screaming thing? I responded to you. That was right. Do you know why Jesus would take this and have this opinion? Everybody listen to me. Jesus doesn't care about the method. He doesn't care about the method. He just cares about meeting people where they are. Can somebody get that one? But listen, we've got a serious problem in the church today. We've got a serious problem in the church today. And the problem is we elevate method over mission. We elevate method over mission because we got, we got folks saying, no, no, no. If you want God to move in your life, this is how it happens because that's how it happened with me. Then you got another group over, and sometimes this is in churches. They're going, they're going, but, but no, no, no. You, 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 can't, you can't have people come to the aisles and pray because that's not how it happened when I We can't take up the offering at the end because that's not how I. We cannot not wear ties. Thank God we've been delivered from ties on the platform. I didn't say ties, I said ties to make sure we're clear on that. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm all for looking sharp. I like looking sharp. But listen to me. Everybody listen to me. Sometimes we get caught up and we're like, well, I got to put on, I got to put on my best for Sunday. Well, but listen to me. I'm putting on, you're putting on your best on Sunday for God. My question is this. What about the other six days? <laughs> Boy, it got good in here, right? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Here's where we're committed. We're committed to this. We will not elevate method over mission in this church. Because we love what God loves, and we're going to meet people where they are to help them know God, discover their purpose, and begin to make a difference. Can somebody say amen to that? That's your reason. Listen, here's a question that we ask all the time. We ask this every week. I ask the staff this, and I require answers. Who moved? Who moved this weekend? Who went from having their heart hard to giving their life to Christ? Who moved? Who went from, from being resistant to God to allowing God to love them and give them his life? Who got baptized this weekend? Who went to discover this weekend? And I don't ask for just for numbers. I say this. We say, give me, give us their names. And you know what we do every single Monday? We get together and we celebrate the people who have taken steps and made the move. Amen. Why? And here, here's what we're doing. Listen to me. Listen. And if we, if, we, if we don't see the movement, you know what we do? We change the method. If we don't see the movement, we change the method. So that is the reason. Let me just say this. We will always be changing here. We will always be changing the method can change. We're married to the method. Excuse me. We're, not, we're married to the mission, but we're not married to the method. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Now, the last thing as I wrap up this morning is that we've got to have motive. In other words, it's the why. It's the why we do what we do. Why we do this? Why do we work so hard? Why are we married to the mission? 
but not the method. Why are we always asking ourselves questions like, how can we reach more people? How can we help people that are hearts are hard? How can we help the people their hearts are shallow? How can we do that? How can we get more people in school of ministry? How can we do that? How can we get more people to discover? How can we get more people baptized? How can we get more people filled with the Holy Spirit? How can we do that? What drives us is the why. You say, what drives us? Well, there are two things. The first one is this. The first one is the fact that a few thousand years ago, Jesus was standing with his disciples. And he asked the disciples a very important question. He said, what are people saying about me? What's the word on the street? They gave a variety of answers. And then Peter stood, stepped up and said, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> you're not smart enough to figure that one out on your own. My father in heaven, he helped you with that one. And he made the scripture up on the, on the screen, please. He makes a statement. And this is why we do, one of the reasons we do what we do. This is why. Jesus said, I will build my church. Listen to me. He was looking at the future and he said, I'm going to do it. But what he was also seeing is that he was seeing us today. He was seeing us today. He was seeing us talking about people coming to know him and discover their purpose and make a difference. Because that's how the church grows. He was seeing us do that. That's why we do what we do. Because if we don't do it, who will? You see, but Jesus said, but I'm going to do it. Doesn't Jesus build the church? Well, listen to me. Listen. Jesus is in heaven. We're his body. We're the extension of Jesus in the earth. So Jesus is standing there and he's looking and he's looking at this church. He's looking at the today. But you know, there was something that stood between him and that mo- uh, between him and this moment. It was the cross. And you know what? He willingly went to the cross in order to make that dream come true. He willingly laid his life down. He shed his blood. He sacrificed. So we could do what we get to do today. That's to build his church. That's reason, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we will sacrifice. If you cut us, we'll bleed this. Because eternity is at stake. Eternity is real. But then there's, a, there's another reason. There's something else that drives us. Please listen. If you hear anything of this message, please get this. There's something else. And it's a moment in time. It's a moment in time that every single believer will experience. It's a moment in time that I don't care if you believe it or not, it's going to happen. If you don't believe it, it doesn't make this moment not true. This moment happening, not true. There's a moment in time, ladies and gentlemen, where we as believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Talking about why, motive. Why do we do what we do? There's a moment. The Bible talks a lot about it. A lot of Christians don't understand this. They don't know this. But you're going to stand before Jesus. There are actually two judgments. One has everything to do with what Jesus has done. It's a judgment of sin. But then there's another judgment seat, and it's about what we have done. It's a judgment seat of Christ. How we lived our life. Romans chapter uh, 14, verses 10 and 12 says, Why do you try to say your Christian brother is right or wrong? Why do you hate your Christian brothers? Watch this. We will all stand before God to be judged by him. The holy writings say, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will say that I am God. And every one of us will give an answer about himself. Everyone. Everyone. Wouldn't it be great if we knew the answer to the questions ahead of time. Because Jesus is not going to talk to us. He's not going to ask us about and 
commend us on raising our children without killing them. How many know that's a, that is a pretty big, good deal? You know what I'm saying? Well, especially the teenage years. He's not going to talk to us about how much money our, we made in our retirement and all of that. The, the, the answer, excuse me, the question is going to be, and I don't know how exactly how it's going to be worded, but the question is going to be, what did you do with your life? Did you use your life to make a difference in somebody else's life? How many wants, wants to pass the test? How many wants to have the right answer? I hate to admit this, but several years ago, this is I was in the 10th grade. Foolish, foolish, foolish. High school, taking the test. Several friends, me and a few of my friends, we had this plan worked out. And man, that plan worked to a T. And cheating on this test. Then, immediately following the test, we discovered that we had been set up by the teacher. He outsmarted us. That was on a Friday. I was miserable Saturday because I'm thinking, my dad's going to kill me. I'm dead. Because there's no way I can get out of it because not only is he my dad, but he's also my football coach. He's at the school all the time. He's going to find out. So that was in, I was at church. This is, this is evidence that the, Satan, the devil does come to church. I'm on the back row and I'm miserable because I'm thinking, I'm dead. Then I remembered my dad is, has the master key to all the doors. Got home from church and I said, Dad, forgot a book at school, which that part was the truth. Went to, into the building, opened everything, the doors up. I went into the teacher's uh, uh, school, the classroom. This is bad. Confession is uh, good for the soul, but bad for the uh, reputation, right? And I just, pulled, I just pulled out my test. I threw my friends under the bus. I'm sorry. If you're watching, I'm sorry, guys. And I just took it and shredded it up on the way home and, and got rid of the evidence. So on Tuesday, on Tuesday, I'm in class, and the, my, 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 my friends are going down like flies. Then the teacher looked and said, Mr. Welch, where were you? And I was like, I was here. Angel, I was here. He said, Well, I can't find your test. And everybody was like, Yeah, he was here. He said, Well, here's what's going to happen in the morning. You come and you're going to take the test orally. I said, Okay. So I, I showed up the next morning. I took the test orally and I aced it. You know why? I knew the questions ahead of time. I knew ahead of time what that teacher was going to ask me. I believe God is trying to communicate something to you. And he's saying this morning, I'm trying to give you the questions ahead of time so you'll know the answer on that day. What, what did you do with your life? Did you use it for yourself or did you use it to make a difference? So you can be here this morning and you're going, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I'm making a difference. Well, here's another question. What about your friends? What about your neighbors? They're going to stand there too. Are they going to know the right answers? Because if they don't, what's keeping you from helping them? What's keeping you from helping them make that process to becoming a life giver? What's the hold up? Because the last thing we want to do is for us to have the right answers, but they don't. Eternity as its stake, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we are passionate about our mission, helping people know God, helping them discover their purpose, and helping them make a difference. Helping Jesus build His church. Did anybody get anything out of this moment on a Sunday morning. Amen. Look, get in the game. Get in the game. Get in Discover. Get in the game because we can make a big difference in eternity and we can go to a whole other level in making this church greater than it already is. 
Thanks for listening to the Word of Life Center podcast. You can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at our website, wordoflifecenter.org.